How y'all doing? You know, I'll get right in here. As we were so- singing the third song, I don't know if you have the, the lyrics here with you, but uh, pull that one out. I didn't realize that before, but this third uh, song where it says the stand, it really speaks about this series that I'm that I'm preaching. Um, two were like this last uh, block, kind of a second second to the to the end, where it says. So what can I say? What can I do but offer this heart, O oh God, to offer my heart, to offer this heart, O oh God, completely to you. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned, like giving God our heart, heart in awe of the one who gave it all. And so I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered. All I am is yours. And that really talks about this series um, <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Because I, I don't know if you were in church last Sunday, but I started to talk about a series uh, that really is about the tabernacle. And I, I started this series because there was something about uh, the tabernacle and the concept of it that I could never really understand. It's like, why would God give the law if the law cannot save, right? And so when, once I started to look into it and God triggered my, my, my interest and put my attention toward it, I figured out that God wanted to teach Israel something very important with the tabernacle. And that, I mean, we're talking 4,000 years ago, right? And so when you look at the tabernacle, I mean, God has just liberated Israel and has brought Israel out of Egypt has liberated Israel out of Egypt, out of the slavery, and he has always promised them that there is the promised land, right? That was the covenant that God made with Israel. There is the promised land. But in order to move them from liberation to the promise that God had for their life, he could not do that but by teaching them first something that's very important, something that's very crucial to settling in the country. I noticed... You know, what would have happened to Israel? I mean, Israel always had this, this vision uh, about going to the promised land and then one day they're going to arrive in the promised land. And so people are like, where are we going? Where are we going? We're going to the promised land. And then once they're in the promised land, they settle down and they, they, they build houses and everything and no prophet ever stands up in the promised land and says, so where are we going? Where are we going? Because they're here. They have arrived at the promise already. And the, thing, the key element that God had to teach them early in the desert, and that was all about his presence, to learn God's presence was vital because otherwise people would have gone nuts. They would have just turned in circles like, okay, what should we do? What should we do? We have to learn God's presence. It's so vital for God. We, we, all of us that are sitting here probably are saved, right? I hope. If not, come talk to us afterward. But, you know, God has liberated us. He has brought us out. He has set us free by His grace alone. It was not by our works. It's, it's, a, it's His grace as a gift through faith. He has set us free. He has liberated us from our, sinful, uh, from our sinful nature and everything so that by Christ we are redeemed. And He has a promise for our life. He wants our life uh, to be fruitful, right? We've talked about this already in a couple of Sundays. But we will not bear fruit and will not get there to that promise if we don't first learn the presence of God and what it means uh, to come into the presence of God. And so I call it the sermon series, Take Me In, because this, that's really uh, this, this concept behind it. God taking us in. It's not us forcing our way into the presence of God. But it's, it's an invitation, right? God invites us to come into his presence. We send out an invitation to come here to the park today to have an outdoor service. Nobody forced our hands, right? Everybody here sitting is volunteers. You came out because there was an invitation coming out and you, you came and you responded to it. And the same way with the presence of God. God gives his invitation to everybody. The invitation is out to everybody. Come, I'm here. Well, what are you waiting for? Why are you not coming in? Why, why are you procrastinating? Why are you wasting your time? Come in. The presence of God is here. And you have to think about, I mean, when we talk about the presence of God, it's the presence of the person who created the universe. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? 
He, they, everything is in his grasp. He is the Lord. He is the Savior of our life. And we can just be in his presence. And this, this magnificent person, God, he says, you can come into our presence. You can just come in, come into the presence. And so um, it's all about like learning the presence of God. That's really important. And I started uh, by Exodus chapter 27. If you have your Bibles with you or an app, pull it out. I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 27 today. Because well, the, first, the first series I talked about um, what does it mean for, the, from, for the Israel being encamped all around the tabernacle and from the outside looking in. From the outside, they're looking at the tabernacle and all that they're seeing is a white fence. Do you remember that? All the people are seeing is a white fence representing white is, is, is a representing this righteousness, right? And so people standing off and they're making the decision that there is a holy God. There's the cloud. There's fire there. There's the presence of God. And when you, when you see, just imagine you could see the presence of God from a distance. And you just know that's the presence of God. Would you go in? I don't know, maybe I would be hesitant. I'm like, man, I have sin in my life. I would first go through all my sins and make a checklist. Okay, have I repented of this? Have I repented of that? Am I, am I okay with God before I want to go in? And that's this guilt. That's the conscience. When, God, when this righteousness of God, God's holiness, it really it, it aims toward our self-righteousness and our pride and everything, our sin within us because it makes us aware that we're, we're, there is nothing that we have. There is nothing inside of our pockets that makes us righteous, that makes us good before God. We, are, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? And we cannot go into this presence. So we're standing far off and we're just looking at this white fence. But yet God extends an invitation. This tent, the tabernacle, was not set up for the priests or for Moses to have a happy time in his, only, in his uh, own personal glorious tent. It was for the people. <laughs> Man, should have thought that one through. <laughs> and so the invitation goes to the people, don't, don't miss out on it and come, come, come into the presence. Because, and God had to teach them that what, what it means to come into God's presence, we are guilty and we need an atonement. It means God taught Israel a life under atonement, a life under redemption, of being redeemed, of being set free. And uh, like I shared last week, with this tabernacle, even though Israel encamped all around it, on the north side, the east side, the west side, the south side, there was only one gate. There was only one gate in. God did not create a fence with all open doors. Everybody just walk in as you please and take what everything is yours and just come in and go out however you want. Uh, just come and have a great time. That, that's not it because God wanted to teach us something. And so he asked everyone to come literally through the gate. Because right by the gate, there's something very crucial and very important. And I want to preach about this today. I call this uh, second part, the gate. Because there's something at the gate that meets us. Because it is at the gate where the sacrifice is. is the sacrifice, there is the altar on the inside. But the killing of the animals in the Old Testament was outside the tabernacle and outside those cords. And here, um, Exodus chapter 27 uh, where it says in verse 9, and this is all the instruction about the tabernacle. Uh, and you shall make a cord of the tabernacle on the south side, and the cord shall have hangings of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits long. It was on the long side, it was 150 feet long, and on the, on the sides, it was um, 75 feet wide. And then there's instruction about it. Uh, it's, it's 20 pillars, and their 20 bases shall be of brass. But the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. So you have 20 poles that are of solid brass. Brass wouldn't rust, it wouldn't wither or anything. It's this heavy, solid thing. But, but the, the thing where it's tied in, it's made of silver. 
So you already have, uh, it's like, okay, it's getting more precious. It's actually interesting on it, but the tabernacle, you, the outer core and everything is brass. You walk more toward in, all of a sudden everything turns silver. Then you come into the holy place and everything is gold. And you, you realize the more you get into the presence of God, the more beautiful and more splendid it looks. And you see this in your own prayer life. You stand far off of God and you can just only make assumption about who this God is or what this God wants for your life. But the closer you draw in in prayer into the presence of God, the more peaceful it gets, right? Did you ever notice that? The more peaceful it gets, the worries are gone and the more beautiful it gets. The closer you draw in into the presence of God, the, silent, the more silent it gets. The phone is shut off. It's not even an issue anymore. The problems are not even an issue anymore. Everything looks like there's just gold. Every, you're like, almost like surrounded by gold. And so he gives here the instruction for the tabernacle. And then in verse 16, it says, For the gate of the court... There uh, shall be a screen 20 cubits long of blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine uh, twin linen embroidered with needlework. And it shall, shall have four pillars uh, and with them four bases. And so God gives them an instruction about this whole long fence, but there shall be one gate and the one gate is on the east side. Do you ever wonder why God put it on the east side and not toward the north? Because that's where the North Star comes out. And like, like, why on the east side? What happens on the east, right? It's the sunrise. It's the morning time. It's the morning time. It's like what this most precious time. We all know that morning times, our mind is fresh. It's like this most constructive time or productive time that we have is in the morning. And it's like God's calling Israel hey, in the morning time when the sun rises and the, fall, the sun already falls on this, this gate at the entrance, go and bring your morning sacrifice. Go and bring your morning sacrifice. So it's like early in the morning that people are being called into the presence of God and bringing their sacrifice. The special thing about this whole gate thing is though that it's not just the way in, but something crucial happens at the gate and that is the animal sacrifice. And so there's two things that I really wanna, want you to understand. I know everything is distracting right now. We're on an outdoor service. I saw a lot of birds flying over us earlier. Do you see that? It's like maybe we crushed some animals out there that they're just waiting for that. But don't be distracted by so much around. There is something here I believe that, that the Lord really put on my heart for us to take away. And it's all about Christ. Even though we talk about the tabernacle, there is two elements here that are very crucial. And the number one is Christ is the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. And the other one is Christ is the priest himself too. The whole tabernacle is, is, is basically about us learning um, with Christ to come into the presence of God. So the first thing, uh, Jesus is the sacrifice. In Leviticus, uh, turn your Bibles to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 1 is uh, very early on here when, when, it talk, when God gives the institution about the rituals now and about the sacrifices and how you're supposed to sacrifice. This is what it's saying. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If this offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you shall uh, offer a meal without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting. It's not inside the tent. It was not a butcher place. It was not inside the tent. It was outside the tent. The, the animal sacrifice was taking place outside. And do you remember what it says about Christ, about the coming Messiah in Isaiah 53? That he's the lamb who was like brought to the slaughter. Now in Israel back then when this verse was written, there was no slaughterhouse like that. But there was animal sacrifice. And back then, 
the, there is this analogy to the tent that the sacrificial animals were slaughtered just outside the tent. Their carcasses were burned outside the tent. And we have this verse in Hebrews. And it's always good to compare everything with Hebrews because in Hebrews you really have like this running commentary about what's going on, what was going on at the, like with the high priest and the priest and the sacrifices. So toward the end of Hebrews in chapter 13, Chapter 13, verse 11. Maybe I need to wait for the airplane. <laughs> it's a long airplane. <laughs> but it says here in chapter 13, verse 11, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priests as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Verse 12, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Did you ever wonder why Golgotha at Easter, why this was all outside Jerusalem? Because you could not be killed inside, inside Jerusalem. The tradition is that you would defile the city. So it has to be sacrificed outside. And this is the analogy. Jesus Christ was sacrificed outside the city gates for our sins, for the remission of our sins. And it's already alluded to in, at the tabernacle when the sacrificial animals had to come to the gate. I mean, just think about it. You get up early in the morning and something has been bothering you and you're, you're a part of Israel and you know you need atonement. You want to come into the presence of God and you always see this, this white fence and you feel like right now you cannot approach God. There's just nothing that you can approach God. You need atonement and you're, you're, you grab out of your flock just this little uh, lamb in Leviticus, it talked about either if it is a bull, if it is a ram, if it is a lamb, if it is a pigeon. It doesn't matter how big the sacrifice is. Amen? It's all about what, what you bring that comes from your heart. I mean, if you have been raising animals and, and cattle or whatever, and you get to know those little animals, they grow dear to you, right? They're close to your heart. Remember when King David, when he, when he fell into sin, and then he went out to sacrifice something. And then he came to a guy and he said, hey, give me one of your lambs. And he said, yeah, you can have it for free. You're the king. And David said, no, it wouldn't mean anything to me. Let me pay for it. It must cost me something. It has to cost me something. And so if you're taking this little lamb and you just bring it then to the gate early in the morning and there is a neighbor maybe there too and is bringing a cow there or another lamb or a goat or something like, hey, what are you sacrificing for? It's like, man, this is not of your business. That's in between me and God. But, you know, I, I want to bring it because this, this, this is for me. This is for my sin because I have sinned and I cannot enter into the presence of God. And so they're coming to the entrance of the temple, uh, uh, the entrance of, of, the, uh, of the tabernacle. And there's this wide gate and it's about uh, 30 feet wide. And at those 30 feet, that you have the temple priests already out there and they're asking you, so what are you bringing? Like, yeah, I've, I have sinned. I want to make atonement. And this is going to be a, an, a sacrifice for atonement or for a sin offering. And here's the lamb. And so, and it, it talks then about that the, the priest made the person put, place their hand on the animal. Just a second, let me read this here. No, it's not here. Uh, where, the, where the person had to place a, uh, his hand on the animal, like this transfer of sins, like, Lord, I know s something has to die in order for me to be free. And you love me so much that you, you don't kill me. You don't strike me down, even though I am a sinner. So here it's, it's transferred over this animal, and then, then the animal is killed, is being brought in, into, into the holy uh, place into the uh, cord actually where, where there is the altar and the, and the place uh, where, where it's actually offered there, then and the, uh, the fat is burned up and everything. But here is outside the gate there is, there is Christ as being this picture that he is the one 
who on our behalf was sacrificed. And we don't have to die. We don't have to die because Jesus sacrificed himself for us on our behalf. Just imagine you're meeting Jesus at, at the entrance of the tabernacle and the people, and you're coming there to the tabernacle with empty pockets. And you're like, you know what? I can't afford anything. My, I have a tissue in here for sweat, but I have my, my pocket, I, I just don't have anything. There is nothing inside of me. There is nothing that I can do. There is nothing that I can say that will make me better. There is nothing that I can bring right now that makes me holy, that makes me walk into the presence of a living God. There is not, there's, there's nothing. <laughs> there is nothing I own. There is, no, there is no silver. There is no gold that I can bring that will make atonement for my sin. There's nothing I can do. And right there at the tent, you meet Jesus. And Jesus says to you, look at my hands. Those holes in my hands, they, they paid for you. You don't have to worry about it. I paid for you already. The sacrifice is done already. All you have to do is to accept me by faith. It is by God's grace. Amen. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not by your own doing. It is the gift of God not as a result of work, so that no one can boast. So that no one can boast. So that it's equal for everyone. Each one of us, we need to come to the realization that we are saved by grace. It is accepted by faith. It's not a result of our works, but by what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us already. So we come to Jesus, we come to the entrance of the tabernacle that's teaching us what it means to come into the presence of God and we realize we have nothing. There is nothing that we can come up with. Jesus Christ has been a sacrifice already. But not only has he been the sacrifice for us, there is something else too. Jesus himself is the high priest. He is the priest. In Hebrews uh, chapter 7, just uh, flip your pages a little bit forward here from Hebrews just in chapter 7, let me start with the promise here, maybe in, in uh, verse 21. And this is what the Lord, uh, what, uh, so it's a quote from the Old Testament. It says, the Lord has sworn, has sworn and will not change his mind. You are the priest forever. Jesus Christ is being called the priest. And verse 22 this makes Jesus the guarantor, or guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. The Bible talks about that Jesus is the priest himself. You know, the priest, what was the priest in the tabernacle? It was basically uh, the administrator. It was the mediator uh, who was working at the tabernacle, at the presence of God, uh, knowing the ins and outs, knowing everything that's inside the tent and everything that's going on outside the tent. And if a sinner would come, um, if the sinner would come to the tabernacle, the priest would go out and meet him and, and accept his offering. He would accept the sinner and then bring him in and walk with him through the sacrifices. But now imagine that Jesus himself was the sacrificial lamb. He himself was the priest already. And he is the priest who administrates it too. In verse 20, uh, 26, it goes on and says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy and innocent and unstayed, um, sep separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Remember Ephesians 1 and 2. And verse 27, it says, And he has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for their own sins and then for those people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. In chapter 8, then it talks, Now the point 
And what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Verse 2. A minister in the holy places in the true tent. It was always a foreshadow of the true tent that is, that is uh, to come. And it came already. And what the true tent is the presence of God that we can access wherever we are, right? We, we are right now here in the park, but the presence of God is here. We can enter into, in our time of worship, we can enter into the presence of God wherever we are at because we have had Jesus Christ being our offering and through him, he's, he's the usher. And I want to make this analogy to an usher. You know, when you come to our church, we have greeters at the door that welcome you and then you come into the sanctuary and we have ushers there and um, they sometimes help you find a place here when the sanctuary is full already they, they come and show you a seat it's like somebody waiting at the door waiting for you to come and helping you find your place or wh wh whatever you need so jesus christ is the priest jesus christ is literally he is that usher but he's he's also the one who intercedes on our behalf he's the one who is seated at the right hand of the magic at the right hand of god he's in heaven praying for us all the time don't you think that's incredible that jesus christ who died two thousand years ago he is right now in heaven before god the father and he is praying for you you know sometimes when when somebody's telling you that they're praying for you that's great but he probably is not going to pray for you all your life, right? But Jesus Christ himself in heaven is praying for you and for, your, for every circumstance you walk through in your life. Jesus Christ is in heaven interceding for you all the time. And guess what? God the Father listens to him. Amen? Amen. All we have to do is to learn the presence of God and what that means. And let this Jesus Christ take us in. You know, there's in, in John chapter 10, we have the scripture about um, Jesus as being the door. We always talk about Jesus being the door. He's uh, is this whole passage about him being the good shepherd. And this is in verse 7 where it says, I am the door to the sheep. And uh, verse 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. If anyone knows Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, he is the person who walks in and out free. He walks in and out and find pasture. He doesn't find condemnation. He doesn't find weird things. He, he finds green pasture land. And for me... That's good news. You know, the thing is, Israel encamped all around the, the presence, the tent of meeting, the presence of God. And from the outside looking in, you can only assume how it's going to look inside. But you will never be able to walk in and out and find the pasture land, find peace in God's presence, find the, the presence of God that overshadows uh, everything, every circumstance in the life. You only find that if you come to the door and enter through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, and he's the usher who ushers you in. And in that, you find pasture land. You know, we all know the scripture in, in, in verse 10. Then write the next verse here in John chapter 10. In verse 10, write the next one, we know. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came uh, that they may have life and have life abundantly. Did you ever wonder why those two scriptures are back to back? You know, we sometimes quote, yeah, but they, man, the devil is just coming. He's just trying to steal, kill, and destroy away from me, right? But Jesus says it right following the verse where he says, I am the door. I am the door. Jesus says, I am the door. Anyone who enters by me, he will be saved. And he will go in and out, in and out, and in and out. As he wants to, he comes in and out, and he will find pasture land. You know, the only people that don't find pasture land are the ones who let the devil keep them from it. 
are the only one to keep, you know, it's like you're, you're part of Israel just in camping and you're sitting in your tent and you know that you have guilt in your life and you're looking to the righteousness of God and you're, uh, you're listening to the enemy of your life who wants to kill, to steal and to destroy from you. He wants to keep you from the presence of God by giving you a guilt trip. You're not good enough. Look at your life. Look what you have done. There's, it's just bad. Don't even go there. You know, I, I met a very dear brother just this last week, and as I was talking with him, he said something that was interesting. I thought, he said, you know, I feel like the school system stole my education because at some point they kind of put me uh, back in, into a different group, and I kind of felt like I never caught up, so I feel like my education was stolen from me. And I, 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 I was in... At a point in my life, too, where I felt like, you know, there was a, where I was, where Jan and I, we were burnt out from ministry, but right off of Bible college. We had a bad experience. So for a couple of years, we really didn't want to do anything. We felt like that we were burned. And I, I felt the same way. I feel like this, my calling, my stuff is stolen from me. And maybe you're sitting here today and you feel too like, man, I just look at my past. I look at the road that everything has taken with me. And, you know, stuff has been stolen from me. Maybe your future, maybe your promise, maybe the calling of God has been stolen from you. But you know, the only place and the only time when that statement is true is when you listen to the enemy to keep you away from the presence of God. Because when you, when you shoot that in the wind, what the enemy is just trying to tell you and you is like, you know what? I know my pockets are empty. I know I have forfeit my right to come into the presence of God. There's nothing in me that's good enough, but my sacrifice is right there by the door. All I have to do is to pick up myself, swallow down my pride, and make that humble walk down to the gate and say, Jesus Christ, thank you for the sacrifice that you have, you have put down your life and now not only is he your sacrifice and he says, here's the door, have fun in there. He is the one who is leading you by his hand, grabbing your hand and leading you through the gate. He's the door and he's leading us right straight into the holy of holies, into the presence of God. And this, this is Jesus. And that's why I think this concept is so important about the gate because what happens at the gate is so crucial from Getting in or staying on the outside, it's all about us accepting the offering of Jesus Christ. You know, the thing is, did, did you ever go to a concert and you went to a concert and you kind of came to the concert unprepared and you come to the, to the ticket booth and you realize you have no credit card on you, you have got no money. You've got nothing. <laughs> Maybe you can sell him a shoe or a shirt or you know, trade it in for a watch or something. I don't know if they do it. But you come to the ticket booth and you say, you know what? I've got nothing. And there's a guy standing there by the ticket booth. And he's, <laughs> he says, here's your ticket. You've got a free pass because I've paid for you already. It's all paid already. You've got a free pass and you can walk in. And not only just to walk in, but let me lead you by the hand. Let me show you in and let me show you all the goodies in there. Let me show you what it means to stand in the presence of God, to walk right past the brazen altar, past, past the, 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 the brass, uh, the, the wash basin, past the holy place, into the holy fold, past the curtain, into the presence of God. You know, if Jesus is that usher, and if, the presence, if he's ushering in into the presence of God, what does that make you? If you got this ticket, and this ticket gets you behind stage, <laughs> first row seat, what does that make you? It makes you a VIP. <laughs> Amen. It makes all of us a VIP, a very important person. Well, guess what? God so loved the world that he gave his only and begotten son that no one shall perish, but whoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. That makes us the VIPs. We are so important to God that he paid it all. He allowed his son to pay it all. 
And it's like his, his hands show the marks and his sides show the marks that the sacrifice was paid already. All that we have to do is to go to Jesus Christ, to come to the entrance. There is no other way in. Amen? Jesus Christ is the only way in. There is no other religion. There is no other God. There is no other instrument or, or ritual or anything that you could do. There is only one door into the presence of God, and that is Jesus Christ. And we do that by repentance, by humbleness, by coming in and accepting that sacrifice. And Jesus teaches us what it means to lay that down and then to be taken in by him into the presence of God. That's good news. Amen. So those are two things that are waiting at us at the door. Jesus is the sacrifice himself, but he is also the priest who leads us in.